Good morning, everybody. Thanks for joining the Catalyst uh, today. I'm uh, standing in for John Kulo, who is making his way back from the Golf Professional of the Year conference at Bandon Dunes. So hopefully John has had a nice few days up there uh, networking with his fellow Golf Professionals of the Year. Um, I'd like to welcome Ken Mangle. He's with Four Fitness, and I'm just going to read a quick bio for all of you on Ken, and then he'll jump into his presentation for you. Ken Mangle is a 1994 physical therapy graduate from USC, co-founder of Four Fitness, and a proud SCPJ partner since 2015. Knowing and teaching the why continues to drive Ken after 28 years as a physical therapist and certified strength and conditioning specialist. Ken has been a clinical director and is a rehab therapist and sports performance specialist to some of the top athletes across the nation. He spent four years working with the Chinese Olympic Committee, developing curriculum for the now USC PT Shanghai campus. Ken's love of golf and the sport is gaining popularity, also brought his desire to get in front of the injury and build healthy athletes. A few of Ken's teaching mantras are assess, don't guess, and know your why. Ken, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you and for fitness for your longtime support of the SCPGA. I know you work with a lot of our PGA members. I know you work with a lot of our junior tour players. Um, you guys have some tour players out there that you're working with, and uh, we're just so grateful for your partnership and look forward to you sharing your wisdom with us. So I'll turn it over to you. Well, thank you, Nikki. Thank you for the introduction. And yeah, it's fun with the uh, with the tour players, so many of them that we have too, that are kind of graduates up through the uh, the SCPGA Junior Junior Tour and and through the Toyota Tour and and all of that. So you see that continuum, and you see the uh, kind of the greatness that we have in Southern California, and a lot of it with the with the leadership that we have through the SCPGA. So it's our pleasure to be a part of that, and um, we we look forward to to continuing to do so. So thank you. Well, good morning, everybody, and I thank you for taking time out of your morning to join me live. And if you're joining later on and, and watching this on video, thank you so much for, for taking that op option and, and tuning in as well. My name is Ken Mengel. As Nikki said, I'm a physical therapist, certified strength and conditioning specialist, and co-founder of 4Fitness, and I'm thankful to be here with you today. So let's get down to the heart of matter. Periodization for the golf athlete and why it takes a team. This is really a passion point for me on the team building aspect of it. And the team building can be everything from truly having a golf team at the high school level or the collegiate level, but it's that team of why are we here as professionals within our industry? And that's to affect the greatest amount of influence and change over the athletes that we work with helping them in a very positive manner. And we can do that best when we all work together. So the foundation of athleticism. Today, I wanna to talk to you about what goes in, go, what goes on at our gym at 4Fitness, what we do, how we approach things. The method of training and the communication that I've seen success with over almost 30 years, 28 years as a physical therapist and a sports performance specialist. So that's a long time. I'm highly intentional when it comes to working with my athletes. By intention, I mean focusing on what each athlete needs and what each individual needs within their, their foundation for their athleticism. Flexibility, mobility, recognizing how those two are different. We'll get into that in a little bit. Stability, strength, power, balance, endurance. All of these factors are kind of our base foundations of athleticism. When I screen an athlete, I'm assessing their movement capabilities. How do they move? Not only how far do they move, but what is the quality of the movement? So quality and quantity. We see a lot of athletes, and uh, particularly on, on our junior side of the spectrum, who have tremendous amounts of range of motion, yet the quality of their movement is where they need their improvement. Then you see some of the older athletes that have possibly a mild limitation or even a moderate limitation in their range of motion, but they have a fantastic foundation to the quality of the range that they do have access to. So when I screen an athlete, I'm looking for these movement capabilities. 
I'm looking to identify the causes of the limitations, of the impairments, of the restrictions. So it's not just recognizing that, hey, they don't rotate to their right side in their thoracic spine. Why do they not rotate to their right side in their thoracic spine? Is it their thoracic spine? Is it something going on below the thoracic spine? Is it an old injury history? Is there something else that needs to be addressed? And then we're creating those programs to address that individual and what their, what their why is. This is what the why is. Not only that they don't move in a particular way, why don't they move in that way? And what can we do to enhance that? So this is knowing your why and why that's critical. So how do I plan and prioritize and set goals to improve foundations of athleticism with our athletes? Well, traditionally trainers and strength coaches use periodization. Periodization is, we're gonna go through kind of the four seasons of periodization, and then we'll define periodization a little more formally in a bit. But there are four seasons of periodization. And season one is off season. Now, some people would say this is uh, season four, but we're gonna take this as, as season one for our off season, defined as a period where there's no competition. There's no scrimmage. There's very little that's focused on the sport specific components, but there's a lot that's focused on mobility and strength training. And this is a lot of gym time. This is where we're really putting in hardcore work, big efforts, because this is where our focus is. We don't have to worry about competition. We don't have to worry about soreness two days later. We don't have to worry about stiffness. This is where we really build. Season two is that transition from off season to preseason. Now we start to transition into more sports specific movements. Even in the gym, we start to work on drills that are gonna be separation drills. We start to work on ground initiation drills. We start to do things that are gonna mimic what the sport is going to require. And in our sport with golf, we're starting to mimic the different phases of movement throughout the golf swing. And again, we can't create the golf swing in the gym. We don't try and create the golf swing in the gym let alone even touch on what their swing should look like because that's where our communication with you comes in. That's your game. And our game is how do we get this person moving the best so that you can have the best tool to teach? And that's where preseason really comes in on the sport specific patterns. We shift from the hypertrophy, building a muscle into more power training, which is more of that speed element. And then as we transition closer uh, and closer, we start to go into season. And now we're looking at not only sports specific movements, but now we're looking at them competing. Now in our heads, we've got to be aware of soreness patterns. Are they a 24 hour sore pattern? Are they a 48 hour sore pattern? If they've got a tournament on a Saturday and I'm seeing them on a Thursday, can I train them hard or do I need to put the restraints on? A lot of what we do in season is we maintain the, the gains that we made in the off season. We maintain the gains we made in the preseason. We're looking less about progression in the season of strength and power and maintenance of what we already gained. Because our big goal here is injury prevention and recovery strategies. This then takes us into our postseason. And our postseason is where we're looking at recovery first and foremost. Postseason is that immediate period of, uh, after the season ends, and recovery is our essential piece. Almost no athlete gets through a season in any sport unscathed. And that little bit of a scathe could be something as simple as fatigue level, or it could be something as significant as injury. And our goal, again, if we can minimize and prevent injuries, now we're looking at recovering uh, on a simpler form. And now we're getting into non-specific sport type movements. Um, and, and these are things that we'll dive into a little more deeply as we go through here. So let's look a little deeper at periodization. So let's go to off season. I wanna break down this traditional periodization training. Traditional periodization in some ways has very little direct relationship with our golf athletes, particularly with our golf athletes in Southern California. Traditional periodization is typically broken down into cycles of anywhere from four to eight and sometimes six to 12 week periods. Well, in California, we're playing golf from January 1st to December 31st. So you don't technically have periods or may not have periods where you have a true off season. 
And we'll touch on that as we go through here. So typical off-season in periodization, four to eight weeks, defined by a period of no competition, depends on their age of the athlete. It may be something with our young athletes where we're working on general fitness, general athleticism, movement patterns. It may be if they're a little bit older, this is where we take them into muscular hypertrophy. You get the high school athlete and beyond, we look at hypertrophy, we look at strength. Hypertrophy can kind of get a bad name. We don't necessarily, people are concerned about getting too bulky. Well, it's a very rare breed of person that gets too bulky. And there is a direct relationship on the other side of the coin that we look at that says, muscle hypertrophy is basically building a larger volume of muscle. A larger volume of muscle is known in research to be able to produce a greater amount of force. There's our strength. There's a direct relationship between muscular hypertrophy and strength production, force production. So we do want hypertrophy. We do want to grow and build muscle on these athletes. We're going to do it very focused and very selectively. And again, we're looking at doing it in proportion to what their movement patterns and what their sport uh, demands. So you'll notice here mobility patterns, movement patterns. Mobility is going to be a theme through here. And you see it highlighted in red. It's in red for a reason because mobility is always performed all four seasons of periodization. We look at what DeChambeau did a few years back with his bulking and things like that. And people were worried about him getting bigger, becoming stiffer, not being able to move as well. And he made it a point in interviews to say, one of the key things that they focus on is mobility every session, every day. And that's a key with all of our athletes is mobility, mobility, mobility. Mobility is a, an essential component because it demonstrates the control that we have of our range of motion, which is our flexibility. So this is our key here. Mobility is our ability to control our movements. It's our ability to control the flexible ranges that we have and to use them effectively. Flexibility on its own doesn't have an athletic uh, action, so to speak. It doesn't have the, uh, the ability to create a movement. Flexibility on its own without strength and without the control can actually be an injury waiting to happen. But flexibility with good mobility patterns over the top of it is a, is a way to bulletproof yourself, so to speak, from injury. So preseason, preseason is traditionally, again, four to eight weeks, going to be immediately before the season starts. Unofficial play. So this is where we're getting in the golf industry, getting out on the course, not playing tournaments, but playing some mock tournaments, setting up scenarios and strategies, setting up uh, replications of what our athletes are going to come upon when it does come season time. In the gym, our athletes are focusing on sport specific movement patterns. So this is where we start to take that muscular hypertrophy and the strength that we built in the postseason, and we start to apply it in their sport specific movement patterns, be it ground reaction force creation, rotation and separation movement patterns, shoulder girdle strength and stability patterns that we need to maintain postures. Again, mobility highlighted in red. We continue with the mobility piece. This is again, every season. The focus now is on transition from strength to power. We've built hypertrophy, we've built strength. Now we're working towards building power, which is, can I be strong fast? Can I make force in an instant? And if I can do that, there's my power. So power on the physics end of things, force times velocity. Strength is the force component of the power. We now want to train the velocity end of the power. So this leads us to our in-season. And in-season, particularly for the professional golfer, and particularly in the current format, which, again, it looks like we're going to be uh, seeing some change, which I think is going to be good. But this, the wraparound format that's been in place, there's, there's in-season becomes a, a, a relative term of what month of the season, because the season is pretty much year-round. So in season in the traditional sport, you have a number of weeks of competition and that varies. Now, professional football, there's 17 weeks of competition over 
uh, I believe it's an 18 week period of time. Um, baseball, Major League Baseball, you've got the season starting in April. And if you go into the playoffs deep, you're ending it in November. So you've got a variety of times. Again, golf, you're starting at, uh, in, in Southern California, you're starting January 1 and you're ending December 31. So in season is relative. In the season, we're going to continue with sports specific movement patterns. And this is again where we may be getting a little more fine tuned in our sports specific movement patterns, less of a gross movement pattern for sports specificity and more of a particular where this athlete may show a continued struggle. Always working on mobility and maintaining our strength and power gain. So maintenance is key here. We don't stop strength training. We are just not focused on building more strength at this stage of the game. We're focused on maintaining what we have. So instead of hitting strength work three or four days a week, we're hitting strength work one, maybe two days a week. We're hitting power work one to two days a week. And that's enough to maintain the gains that we've seen in the previous uh, previous seasons of periodization in the postseason and the preseason. So during season, we're looking at injury prevention, recovery. These are our key focuses. So maintaining strength and power, preventing injuries, and maximizing recovery. And those two pieces go hand in hand. So recovery comes right after the completion of your event. It could be after the completion of your day, after your practice round, after your competition round, between first round, second round, second round, third round, et cetera. Recovery has everything to do with putting your body back in the best state for performance the next time, which could be the next day, the next weekend, whatever it might be. It includes nutrition. It includes hydration. It includes sleep, quality, quantity. In order to maintain gains in the off season, we have to make sure that maintain the gains of the off season during our season, we have to make sure that our body is correctly fueled and maintained. And that's where the injury prevention and recovery piece comes in. Postseason, so immediately after the season. So for instance, last day of the season is a Saturday. Postseason is now Sunday. And that's from then on until we hit our next preseason. So postseason is an immediate after. Postseason in our golf. We have a postseason on tour pros. When they play on Thursday, postseason is 18th hole, putt drops in the cup, they walk off. Postseason starts now for Friday's recovery so that they're recovered for Friday. Postseason is focused on recovery. It's focused on rehabilitating any dings, dents, scratches that the athlete might have gotten through the course of the season and hopefully not injuries. Athletes should take a break from competing. So this is, again, the year-round spectrum of sports is, is great to have in Southern California. But with our junior athletes, one of the things to look at is, do they do anything other than golf? Are they participating in swimming? Are they participating in basketball, soccer? Are they doing things outside of their sport? We see this a lot with, with other sports like baseball and basketball that are year-round, their club, their school, their and they don't ever do anything other than that. And those are recipes for problems because we've got overuse conditions, which mean you're not recovering more than you're breaking down. And if breakdown beats recovery, you're looking at an injury. So mobility work is one way to recover. Mobility work is one way to rehabilitate. Mobility work is one way to prevent injury from happening. So I think we all need to take a role in ensuring that our athletes are varied, that they're cross training. This is our cross training season, post season. This is where we look at kayaking, hiking, yoga, Pilates. What else can they do to move in different ways, but still move and be active and still be athletic just in a way that isn't golf, just in a way that gives their body a break in another, in another means. So how do these four seasons translate to the golf athlete. So we look at 
And this is kind of the extreme version of it. And we then take and we modify these extreme versions for all of our golf athletes down through the junior golf athlete. But if we can work with the extreme, it makes working with the others a lot easier. So periodization for the pro golf athlete, Monday is called off season. So what do we do in the off season is we are strength training. We are hypertrophy training. We're doing mobility work and we're working on some recovery stuff as well, but we are focused hard and heavy in the gym. Tuesday and Wednesday, well, that's preseason. Preseason is power focused. Preseason is still mobility focused. Preseason is sports specific movement patterns. So Monday, we may not do a sports specific movement pattern all day because we may be deadlifting, squatting, doing traditional lifts in the gym that are strength builders. Tuesday and Wednesday, we now get specific on what we're looking at in terms of movement patterns. We get specific on what we're looking for in power output, speed, quickness, agility, and as always, mobility. Thursday, hopefully through Sunday, in some cases, it's Thursday and Friday, and postseason can come a little sooner, but hopefully it's Thursday through Sunday. We are now in season. Thursday through Sunday is about maintaining the goals or the, the, the gains made on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. So we still do some strength work. We still do some power work. It is a much more finite amount to keep the body prepped and ready because so much of what we gain can be kept if we keep the nervous system utilizing it the right way. So that's what Thursday through Sunday are, is we're in season. Now, you get to Sunday and Sunday evening to Monday mid-morning, now you're post-season. But I say Monday to Monday mid-morning to midday because by Monday afternoon again, you're in off-season, so you're already back in the gym. So instead of trying to consolidate and make training programs in the traditional way, the trainer working with the golf athlete has to make adjustments. It's most effective when there's communication between the coach, the swing coach, the trainer, and the player. When it comes to our juniors, involve the parents with that. But we need to know how do our athletes perform when they're sore? Can they perform when they're sore? Some people actually feel they perform better when they feel a little bit of that residual soreness, so long as it doesn't impair their mobility. So knowing the athlete is really, really critical, and that's where that communication between coach and trainer comes into play, is if I send an athlete out who's going to be competing, and they tell their coach as they're warming up on the range that they're a little sore that day, it may be because that athlete performs best in that way, and we need to have been communicating so that you don't feel I'm sending out a product that's now got some dings to it, and now we've got some issues. And that's where our communication is really, really critical. So fluid periodization is kind of a new concept on the periodization spectrum. But I really, really like this concept because fluid periodization is the utilization of athlete monitoring systems and the concept of periodization to optimally develop a daily responded training program. So when I say daily responded training program, I mean a daily responded training program. I have systems in place that I've created programs for my athletes, typically by the weekend for the coming week of their, of their, uh, of their exercise sessions with me. Now that I've got those set up, I also have to have 100% willingness to modify those programs based on how that athlete presents to me each given day. So if I have an athlete coming to me twice a week and I've got their program set up on Saturday and I'm gonna see them on Tuesday and Thursday and they come to me on Tuesday feeling good, but they come to me on Thursday having not slept well, I'm gonna to have to do some tweaking and it may be more than just modifying their loads. So how do we... How is what we accomplish in the gym and on the course going to allow this athlete to achieve at their highest level? And that's what we want to think about with the fluid periodization. So a couple of things to, to, to look for when you're looking for working with the trainer that can do these things. One, I, I think TPI certification is still as good as it gets. It allows a common language at the very least, a common language to be shared between the swing coach and the trainer, an understanding of what each is looking at. 
where each's roles are and how we can blend and work together. Communication with our athletes is the second piece that's key to be able to adapt the program each and every session based on that athlete's needs for that day. And that we're constantly assessing and not guessing. So on my end of the spectrum, I'm assessing to see how are they moving? What is their quality of movement, their quantity of movement? I'm assessing to see what is their physical status that day? What is their mental status that day? Have they just finished three final exams and they're coming in in the afternoon and they are spent mentally? And I had a complex program of, of particular movement patterns and things that would be highly mentally engaging for them to do. And I'm going to put that out the window because they're no longer able to do that. I need to modify and I need to accommodate them appropriately. So there's assessing. There's the modification that happens. And there's the communication then that happens back to you to say, hey, I know you see them tomorrow. They just had this happen in their life. I had to modify in this way. Just wanted to give you a heads up and vice versa. This is where we're both looking out for that golf athlete's best, best interest. I also want my athletes to have an understanding of why we're doing what we're doing. I think as a teacher, as a coach, as a trainer, as a physical therapist, ownership of that knowledge gains me more and better, stronger accountability from that athlete. They should know why we're doing what we're doing. They should know why they're being asked to move in certain ways. They should know why they're being asked to do homework on the days that they're not in the gym or at the golf, at the range and, and, and having instruction with you. So knowing the why is critical Knowing the why of each exercise and owning the why of each exercise I put into place for them is critical on my end. And that's going to change each and every day because their program is going to evolve based on their ability and their goals. So some interesting numbers. Athletes have a 36% variance in ability and physical state on any given day. 36% variance is huge. That's, a, that's the difference between performing at an elite level and performing at a very subpar level. And all of our athletes have that ability to have that variance any given day that they come to us. So some questions to think about. And I think that we need to answer them as a coach, as a trainer, is number one, do all athletes adapt at the same rate? And that's no. Do they adapt in their learning capabilities in this, at the same rate? Absolutely not. Physical learning styles, uh, didactic learning styles, whatever they may be, everybody learns at a different rate. Everybody adapts physically at a different rate. We have ranges that we can say in six to eight weeks, I expect to see this. And in two to four weeks, I expect to see this. But two to four weeks is still a 50% variance in the rate. So we've got athletes that are adapting at different rates all the time. As a coach, let the trainer that you're working with, who's working with your athletes, know what you're seeing during practice. Do they have difficulty clearing their left side? Limited in their ability to rotate the thoracic spine in their takeaway position. Whatever it is you may be seeing, that communication is going to help us in, in setting up the programming, it's also going to help us make sure that the athlete is indeed adapting. Because if we think we've been working on something and you're not seeing the result, we need to modify our game so that the adaptation does happen. So number two, and I think this is a really important one, what control do I have over non-athletic activities? So you want to think of things like our, our junior golfers are the great example, college golfers as well, honors classes, AP classes exam schedules, high school dances, recitals, Friday nights. And I don't even need to say anything more about Friday nights or Saturday nights, football games, homecoming, whatever it might be. Sleep deprivation has been shown to increase an athlete's likelihood for injury by 9% in clinical studies. Simply sleep deprivation. How many of our athletes and therefore, how many of us get the adequate, necessary, minimum standard amount of sleep that we should be getting, quality and quantity? 
So when we ask our athletes about their day, what they have planned, we need to take note. Were they up late last night studying for a test? Were they up so late last night studying for a test that they got up late this morning and didn't have time to eat breakfast? They left their water bottle at home, which tells you about their hydration state. There's a football game that night and they're talking to their friends about going. So their mental state isn't focused on the gym. Their mental state is focused on what's going on that night. We need to have that communication and not only have the communication because it builds a relationship, but have that communication because it should affect how we adapt our teaching and training strategies. So we don't have control over that time. What do we have control over? How do we best serve our athletes? Well, assessment. Assess, assess, assess. This is the coaches and the trainers ultimate tool. And this assessment is a part of those questions. How was your sleep? What did you eat today? When did you last eat? That's one of my big questions. You're coming in at five o'clock in the afternoon. When did you last eat? You had a lunch at 1130. Anything since then? Okay, I need to watch for the bonk factor. I need to make sure that I've got something on hand that maybe they're going to need a snack. And I've got some things here that I always keep on the ready just in case. We need to be aware of those things. This is what then leaves, if I assess well and I adapt well, this is my optimized training. This is where knowing my why comes in. Educating my athletes, making sure they know the importance of breakfast, of snacks, of the quality of food that they're eating, of hydration, of their sleep, of a regularity of schedule. Educating our athletes is critical. And I want them to have that understanding. I need them to know the why, because that is going to get the ownership. So I may have to modify a program large scale. I may have to modify a program in slight little tweaks, but it's all going to depend on how that athlete presents to me. Are they at the 36% of the low end of the variance, or are they at their 35th, 36th percentile of the top end of their variance? How can I make things match where their capability is? So let's look at the junior golf athlete. We talked about do all golfers progress at the same rate? And our answer was no. Well, different ages, different genders are going to require different approaches. We need to be mindful of these junior golfers. And for this purpose, I put it age seven to 13. It could be a little younger to a little older, but we differentiate out the high school golfer here in a second. Trainers and coaches, we need to be mindful of their growth plates. We need to be mindful that these are not physically mature, let alone mentally mature uh, individuals that we're dealing with. But on the pure physical end of the spectrum, be mindful of what we're asking of them. Be mindful of what we're asking their bodies to do because their bodies are still in that plastic state and can be highly influenced by what we have them doing. Programs should be on my end of the training spectrum. They should be eclectic. I want an athlete. And I think I want to give you an athlete. I don't necessarily want to give you a golfer at the age of eight, but I want to give you an athlete that you can teach to become that golfer. And if that athlete is able to run, to jump, to crawl, to roll, to balance, to perform fundamental movements. Like they know how to hip hinge. They know how to get into an athletic stance. I want athletes that can do those things. And it's pretty shocking that we see a lot of athletes come in. A lot of our golf athletes come in. And a lot of these kids would take money from me on the golf course every day of the week. They would beat me in, a, in, in stroke play, match play, or otherwise regularly but they don't know how to jump and they definitely don't know how to land and they really are bad crawlers and they hardly know how to roll. And I look at this and I say, we've created a golfer, but we haven't created an athlete. And there's going to be a ceiling there that's going to show up very, very soon if we don't change that. So that's where that comes in. I want that athlete. I want that person to present to you with the ability to do whatever it is you want them to do. And that includes all the mechanics of the golf swing. So this comes into knowing what do they do off the course when they're out of the gym? What are their habits? Are they couch potatoes? Are they on video games? Do they have older brothers or sisters that they do something with? Do they have an active family? Are they playing in other sports? 
are they seasonal in what they do? So are they a soccer player in the fall, but a golfer in the spring and the summer? And in between time, they also go snow skiing. That's what I want to see. I'm looking to build an awareness of physical self. I want them to be aware of their core. I want them to be able to move and control what they often have seemingly as limitless range of motion. These athletes that come in that just have this ability to be so not even plastic, they're rubber and they can move in these great positions and, and be put in, in, into these great ranges, but they don't have the ability to control it. And if we can get them to control that great range, what a benefit that's going to be to their athletic performance. So I have a whole talk on flexibility versus mobility. If you have any questions on, on that and how to look at those pieces, those are one of my passion points is building a mobile athlete. And then the last thing, are they having fun? Training should be fun. Practice should be fun. Scrimmaging, being on the course, doing drills, all of these things should be fun. And I think that's up to us as trainers, as coaches is make what they are doing fun. Golf is ultimately a game. The gym is ultimately a playground. These should be fun, enjoyable times for them to, to participate in these. We get to the high school golf athlete. Now we get a little more serious. Life should still be fun. The game should still be fun. Training should still be fun. But now we've got a little more serious athlete at this level, a little more focused. So again, the prioritization for a high school golf athlete with regards to their training cycle now revolves around their tournament schedule. Their age and their skeletal maturity allows for us in the gym to be a little more intensive on the strength end of their training. We can load them. We can put weights on them. We can have them move against different resistances. And that I think that that's an important factor that now we can look on the uh, physiologic maturity side of things on the hormonal side of things of building an athlete that is now looking to hypertrophy that is looking to gain strength now we also have to recognize that not everybody matures at the same rate so some athletes that we look at that might be a 16 year old that hasn't started to shave yet on the boys side of things and he's still growing every six months out of a pair of shoes is still not physically as mature as that young man who hasn't grown a shoe size in over a year and has been shaving for three years and hasn't grown in height in two years. We can do different things with those people. So that's an important piece to recognize. But the height of puberty is a great time because we've got a great opportunity to affect change. Growth spurts are often seen in this time. And this is an area where educating the athlete and educating the parent really come into play is we often will see that baby deer syndrome, that the once very skilled mover becomes a very clumsy person. The once very athletic golfer is now looking like they're swinging a golf club for the first time. But over summer, they grew four inches and they have two shoe size differences from what they were in the springtime. And that's gonna have to change our approach to how we work with them in the gym, as well as on the training side, on the teaching side, on the course and the range. So being aware of those, those changes is really critical and communicating those that what I see in the gym, that this person's struggling with this now, and we've got a little bit of knee pain as a result of what looks like some growth plate patterns um, and re referencing that to you is going to make a big difference in how you might approach them the next time you work with them, because it definitely makes a difference in how I do. Training needs start to really differ here for males and females. And again, the training may be identical at certain times, but we need to be very aware of our why. Why would training needs have to be different at times? Well, I've got a whole talk again on training the female athlete. Suffice it to say that having an understanding of hormones and their role on energy, on mood, on ligamentous stability and laxity, and injury prevention is absolutely critical. And that's where the differentiation comes in between males and females. And I think that that's a critical piece for everybody to have a base understanding. And again, the old question of what are they doing outside the gym and off the course? What do I have control over? What do I not have control over? But how can I influence the control with education? 
We get to the collegiate golf athlete. Seasons are a little more defined typically here. There's a, there's a, a true season. We've got that, uh, uh, the dates. We kind of know when things are at. We know when league finals are at. We know when NCAAs are at. We can kind of gear things to be peaking at the right times. This is, uh, again, this is a little more typical of a global athlete in periodized programs. This is where maturity, travel, and commitment really play a role. And what do I mean by that? Well, we really need to look at what we're dealing with. And what we're dealing with are late teenagers to early 20s that are dealing with conditions of sleep deprivation. We're dealing with conditions where nutrition may not be the best. We're dealing with conditions where they've got exam schedules, they've got parties, and we're dealing with conditions as an athlete where they have new travel rules being brought in that they may not be familiar with. And these travel rules may involve uh, time zones. And when you start to involve time zones and travel and frequency of travel, they may have traveled in the past for AJGA tournaments and things like that, but that's once every couple of months. Now you've got golfers traveling once every couple of weeks for, for their, their tournament play. And again, maybe crossing time zones and sleeping in strange beds and changing their nutrition habits and their hydration habits. All of these pieces are really, really important places where we can affect change by working on our education with these collegiate golf athletes. So then we get to the competitive amateur and the professional golf athlete. So often these have a very compressed off season and preseason. Again, with the way the schedule has been uh, on the PGA schedule for the last few years with the wraparound season, it's been a very compressed off season, preseason. We have, this is where a personalized fluid training program is really essential. That ability to adapt to teach our athletes how to monitor and manage themselves is really, really important. These are top athletes that we also push for strength and power and mobility and balance and endurance. Each one of our athletes starts their day with a personalized dynamic mobility and warm-up program. They also have a dynamic warm-up program that they utilize every time they hit the range within 15 minutes of hitting the first ball they hit at the range. Recovery work is very, very intentional. They're educated on the need for their hydration, their nutrition, for sleep and recovery. There's incorporation of other avenues of training and recovery, Pilates, yoga, massage therapy, the different uh, modalities that are available, compression devices, et cetera, that are available for recovery. But again, Education remains a big key here um, for these, these athletes. We're always working to balance proper sleep and recovery, nutrition, hydration when they're traveling. And that's really the big challenge here. How do we, how do we optimize recovery when all the recovery seasons are compressed? So why periodization takes a team? Well, I think the, the definition of periodization for training explains it all. The systematic planning of athletic or physical training involving cycling various aspects of teaching, practice, and training during specific periods in order to reach the best possible performance. Again, it's not just the periodization of the gym training. We're talking the planning of athletic or physical training both in the gym and on the range and on the course. It involves cycling various aspects of teaching, practice. We don't, on the training side, we're not teaching the golf swing and we're not practicing the golf game in any aspect with them. We're working on the training component, but the teaching and the practice also has that cyclic component. What you may be working on at the end of season and early preseason with somebody is what we want to make sure on the gym side, we're complementing. So again, if you're doing something and we're not aware of, and we're doing something and you're not aware of, we're missing the, the ability to optimize this athlete's periodized program because their periodized program 
is teaching, training, practice on the range, on the course, in the gym. And it's all with the ultimate goal of getting them to reach their best performance. But if we're not on the same course, if we're not hiking the same trail to the top of the mountain, we may have some very, uh, uh, some varied outcomes. And uh, we want to we want to manage those outcomes as best as we can and have a have something we can really um, predict. So building a better golf athlete. In order to build a better golf athlete, I really think that fluid periodization in the gym, at the range, in teaching sessions is, is one of the keys. It's what I've practiced for 30, nearly 30 years in sports rehabilitation and fitness. It's communication. Communicating, communicating, communicating. It's kind of like the assess, assess, assess. Well, communicate, 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 communicate what we assess, communicate what we see, communicate what the goals are that we each have so that we're making sure that we're serving that athlete the best way possible. So it's communication between the coach and trainer in varied forms, whether it's a phone call, whether it's a text message, an email. I use Google, uh, Google Drive folders and sharing um, uh, different mobility and exercise applications that we're doing with uh, regards to um, what is being worked on from your teaching end, the training end that the athletes are often conveying to me that, hey, we're working on really getting that left hip to clear at this point in my downswing and I'm having some trouble here. And I look at some things and I see some things going on with the foot that also associate with the hip. Well, I'll take some video of those and show the befores and the afters and share that with their coach and make sure that they know, hey, we're working on these things and here's how we're working on it. And if you have any thoughts or ideas with regards to other things you're seeing, let me know so that we can continue to build this. There's some great apps out there. Coach Now is a great one. There's some other apps out there that allow us to do these things. And it keeps the communication simple, keeps it straightforward, and it keeps it, again, it fits in our schedule. It's easy, it's concise, and it's, it's click and go. It also allows us to, uh, again, share what we see on our evaluations and our assessments. I would say monthly to no more than quarterly contact is really, really critical between myself and the swing coach that my athlete is working with to make sure that we're staying on the same page. Again, pictures, videos, anything you can share, anything I can share. And I, I really think that that's an important, uh, important component of what is gonna take our athletes to the, the highest levels that they can, they can get to. So make sure that who you are working with, who your athletes are working with, the trainer that they're seeing and, and working with is able, number one, to communicate with you effectively, willing to communicate with you effectively, and does communicate with you effectively and be that same way on the other side. Reach out to them, let them know what you see, what you think, what you want this athlete to be able to do and make that relationship really happen for our athletes. So I've said it to all of my students and interns and assistants throughout my career, assess, don't guess. Know your why. These are two things that absolutely ring true to me every day in practice is assess and don't guess and know your why. If we are doing something without having a true purpose for it, then we are doing a disservice to our athletes in the gym or elsewhere. If we don't know what to do and we're putting together a general program because it seems to fit, well, let's find out what to do by assessing. And if my assessment doesn't show me enough, then I need to get another set of eyes in to take a look and make that assessment with me and help me out through that. And that's one of the things I love to do is collaborate with golf instructors, with other trainers and physical therapists. That's part of that team building and that mentorship work. We all need a mentor and we all should be mentoring. And I think that this is one of those areas where we can really help each other. Let's assess and not guess, and let's really know our why, and let's share our whys so that we can be better all the way around. I wanna thank you all for joining me today. It is, uh, it's an absolute blast to be able to put talks together, to share information. I love, uh, 
I love the teaching end of things. I love the collaboration end of things more than anything. Building those relationships is really important. I want to thank uh, Nikki and John, the SEPGA, for setting this time up, for uh, allowing me to participate with you guys. And, and I hope that I've given you some insight into the work that we do off of the golf course. And I hope that uh, I've given some, uh, some insight and some inspiration to the work that uh, I hope that we can do together to build our athletes uh, bigger, stronger, and uh, more bulletproof for their futures. So thank you, guys. Ken, thank you. Um, we do have one question before we let you go. Uh -huh. um, this is from Tom Parker. Ken, do you also work with senior athletes, folks who may be quite a bit less mobile? Um, is there, do you, your same approach apply to them? Absolutely. Yeah. And, and Tom, yes, absolutely we do. So I, I have uh, right now, my youngest athlete just turned from eight to nine. So she's nine. My oldest athlete is 82. Um, the senior athlete, uh, and really kind of starting from my ripe old age of, uh, in, in fifties, uh, all the way up through kind of part of that goal is I want to minimize my loss of speed. I want to maximize my ability to continue to play the game at a level that I feel like I want to play the game at mobility is, is the single biggest factor that we can employ with our senior golfers. Um, we see a lot of limitations simply because of lifestyle for most of us. Um, how much time we spend in the car, how much time we spend at desks, things of that nature. Getting these, uh, the mobility factors improved with these athletes is step number one. Obviously, we're always going to look to build strength. It's never too late to build power. Um, slow our loss is kind of one of those things that we look for as, as we get older is we may not be able to prevent loss of, of strength, power, distance but we can surely slow that process down. And uh, yeah, working with senior golfers there, it's extremely rewarding too on that end from, from a personal perspective, because you get to see people come back in with that smile on their face after saying, you know what, I'm, I'm, I'm driving the ball with my buddies again. I'm not the guy that's, that's uh, you know, the first to hit his second shot. Um, and you're starting to see these pieces come around. To somebody that my 82 year old is, he doesn't have to use his golf club like uh, like a walking stick or a, a cane anymore to step in and out of bunkers because his balance and his mobility have come back up to a level where he's got the confidence to step in and out. And so you see the whole spectrum in that. And absolutely, this, the senior golf athlete is they're still an athlete and we still treat them like an athlete. And it's just, you know, what do what do they need? Great. Well, thanks for sharing. Ken, thanks for your time. I know you're very, very busy. I'm sure you've got a client waiting for you uh, as we speak. So thank you for your time today. Thank you for all that you do uh, with the partnership that we have uh, with For Fitness and the SCPJ. We look forward to continuing that for many, many years. Thanks to you and uh, all the success for the rest of the year. Thank you, Nikki. Thanks, everyone, thank you guys for joining very much. us. I appreciate it. Have My pleasure. Bye-bye. Thanks, Bye -bye. Ken. Thank you, Tom.